Thank you, Lisa. If that doesn't encourage you, I might as well sit down. It's for you. And you can just take you out of that and put a blank. You can put your name in there. He came for you. And uh, that's what Christmas is all about. I was trying to do some shopping on Amazon the other day. That's about all the shopping we've done this year. Somebody, I think Caleb and Autumn, they were still at the house the other day, and they said, now let me, let me preface this. My wife is doing most of the shopping. Okay, if I order something, I, I usually have it sent here. I don't want you to think of me in a bad light, but I don't care what you think about her. <clears throat> Caleb called and said, you have 14 packages that came today. Uh, I was trying to do some shopping the end of the week, actually for my wife, and I kept, I kept reading the words, won't arrive until after Christmas. And I'm thinking, what good is that? That's no good to me. If it's not on time, right? If it doesn't get here when I think it ought to get here. Uh, punctuality, for me personally, is a pet peeve. For me, I can't stand to be late. It drives me crazy. And, um, and I, 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 I'm, I'm thinking I might not be the best preacher or have the best sermons. I may not be the best educated, but I can, I can be here on time. You know, I can do that. Um, and I was reading uh, recently in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. And I want you to notice with me the verse. The Bible says, But when the fullness of time was come. When the fullness of time was come. Well, studying that phrase, one commentator said, that means when the time was right. Aren't you glad he came when the time was right? Aren't you glad you said, well, you know, he, he could have come earlier. Uh, what if he had waited to come until the 20th century? Think about all the technology. Think about how the message would have spread. No, he came when the time was right. And I want to talk about that. Let's pray. We'll look at this passage. Father, help us this morning as we try to focus our attention on the real meaning of the season, the reason for the season. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would be able to tune out from all the distractions. will not be very long. And yet what we have to say is very important because it's your word. And uh, Lord, that's all that matters in this day in which we live. Uh, we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse number uh, 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, and I want you to notice this phrase, were in bondage, under the elements of the world. I want you to think with me for a moment. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about the predicament of the people. If you know much about the book of Galatians, you know that legalism had crept into the churches. We read in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6, Paul writes to these believers and he said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. There's only one gospel. There's only one gospel. And here, as Paul writes to, Galatia, to the churches at Galatia, as he is inspired by the Spirit of God, he speaks of another gospel, but then he clarifies himself, and he says, but it's not another gospel, because there's only one gospel. And that is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world. There's no other gospel. One gospel. But what was happening to these people who had put their faith in the gospel is that Judaizers had come and uh, they had begun to propagate legalism in the churches of Galatia, trying to convince these 
believers that they had not done enough in order to be saved. Trying to discourage them because they had simply believed, which is the only thing you can do to be saved. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. What does God say about them? You bunch of foolish Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. You guys, what are you thinking? That's what he's saying. What are you thinking? Who are you listening to? By the way, it's always a who. It's always a who. Who you, who you been listening to? He said he was crucified among you. He had <coughs> evidently been set forth among you. And then in chapter 5, verse 7, he said, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? So they were struggling with their position in Christ. And Paul writes to them and from where they had come. He said, he said listen, don't forget what you believed. You believe the gospel. You believed in a resurrected Savior. Don't let somebody talk you out of your peace and joy and satisfaction by adding to what Jesus spoke of when he said, it's finished. However, in chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul writes, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage. We were in bondage. And I'm going to explain that to you. It means enslaved. Look at chapter 3, verse 19. We're going to read a few verses here, about six verses. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. So Paul writes to him and he said, when God gave the law, he never said there was a law that you could keep in order to have eternal life. He never said that. Look on down, verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin or that we're all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. Here's what he said. That law, that Old Testament law, that, that you, don't, you don't get saved. How many of you are glad you don't have to keep the Ten, ten Commandments to go to heaven? I'm, I'm mighty glad about that. Can I be really honest with you? I struggle with that line one sometime. Don't look at me like that. Don't tell me you don't ever lie. You know them little white lies you say you tell? They ain't white. All right. I, hey, how many of you are glad? I, that, that one covet, I have a hard time with that one too. I struggle with that one. I see stuff right? I see what people drive. I see where people live. I, I, I see what people have. I, I see, hey, I got to be really careful. Can I be really transparent with you? Um, I, I look at people who all they do, they work and go home and, and, and that's not what I do. And, uh, and uh, you know, they're not involved in church. They're not involved in ministry. It's just work and, and go home. And sometimes I think, man, that'd be nice. There goes another one I broke. <clears throat> You say, well, then why did he give us the law? Paul told us here. He said, God gave us the law. Our law, the law is our schoolmaster. You know what the law does? It points out how, how big a failure we are. Don't you love teachers who love to use bright red ink when they grade papers? And uh, you get a paper back and it, it looks like it's been the victim of an assassination attempt. And there's red X's all over it, you know, and, and you look at that. What's that teacher saying? You're a dummy. That's what she's saying. What's the law say? The law says you're a sinner. The law says you're never going to be good enough to save yourself. The law says you have got to have a Savior. And that's where we were before we got saved. 
we were in a fix. Because there was nothing we could do to save ourselves. But if you look at this passage, it goes, it goes right into God sent forth His Son. He was the answer to our predicament. He was the Savior and is the Savior of the world. So we see the predicament of the people. Let's look at the initiative of the Father. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Notice the first three words in this verse, in our text verse. God, it's not the first three words. First three words I put down on my outline. God sent forth His Son. Now I want to stop right here and I just want to tell you, please understand how much God loves you. You see, this whole idea of salvation was not man's idea. It was not humanity's effort to better themselves. It was God's initiative. Why? Because He loves us. That's why. God sent forth His Son. We didn't ask for it. We certainly don't deserve it. There's nothing we could do to earn it. God initiated the plan of redemption. It's His idea. Taylor and Autumn left Monday, and uh, let, me, let me look at, I got three verses here I want to just show you real quick. John three sixteen. for God so loved. We can stop right there. Why did he send his son? For God so loved. Romans 5, 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him? 1 John 4, 9. And this was manifested or revealed the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world. So if you ever question whether or not God loves you, just remember that of his own initiative, he gave his son. Caleb and Autumn came by Monday on their way out. Yeah, you know, they, they really, in my mind, kind of left last September when they left on deputation a year ago. And uh, our house was kind of their home base and where uh, Autumn got all her Amazon packages. <laughs> uh, so, you know, they, they'd come into town for two nights and be gone for two weeks or whatever, going to churches. And then uh, Monday morning, they left. They came by here, and I'm, I'm a big crybaby, and uh, I, I'll cry at the drop of a hat, and I'll drop the hat. I mean, that's just the way it is. But, uh, but they came by, and I, I didn't get really emotional. I, I, was, I was in pretty good shape. And uh, good, don't you hate goodbyes? Man, I hate them. I hate them. I took, when we took our kids to college, I, I would cry. Man, I cried. You, you would have thought they had died. And I would have to text them because I couldn't call them because I wasn't able to talk. And I'd have to text them and say, look, I don't want you to think I'm sad that you're in college. I'm glad you're doing what you think you need to do. Okay, it's all good. Uh, but I said, you know, I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to make a scene right here. They're leaving. And, and I could kind of tell this was different for Caleb, too. And so they came by the office and we said goodbye. And I gave them a hug and they left. And I was working on this message, and literally, I went back to my desk, and I read this verse, that God sent His Son, and I began to weep. I don't, I don't know that I love the Bay Area enough to give them my son. But God loved me enough to give me His Son. It was His idea. His initiative. It was His plan. God loved us. Number three, the miracle of His birth. Look at verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman. That's an interesting phrase, made of a woman. I want, I want us to stop and consider that for just a moment, if we could, because that one statement, made of a woman, substantiates so much of the doctrine that we believe. That, that one verse, made of a woman, it, it substantiates the doctrine of incarnation. We say, I don't even know what that means. That means that God became flesh. That's, that's, what, that's what Christmas is. It, Jesus was, 
And, and I'm, not, I'm not a stickler on this. And I, I sometimes say we're so glad for Jesus' birth. But Jesus didn't have a birth. Jesus is eternal God. Jesus always has been, always will be. What happened in Bethlehem was not so much his birth as it was his incarnation. You know what it was? It was Jesus changing addresses. He left heaven and came to earth. Bummer. That's a bad move right there. But as we think about the incarnation, John 1, 14 said, and the word, capital W, Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us and beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So when God used the phrase made of a woman, he reminds us that, hey, he became man. That's what happened. How many of you ever watched the show Undercover Boss? You ever seen that show? I hadn't seen it in a long time. I don't even know if it's on anymore. But it was a two-time award-winning reality series where high-level executives would anonymously slip into the rank and file of their own companies. Okay? A really cool show. And uh, the guy who owned the company one day would show up as just a common worker in the company uh, with a fictitious name, an alias. And he would come in and... uh, they, and the people that worked for him would have to train him. And it was a real eye-opener because this, the owner of this multi-million dollar company would begin to ask this person who worked for him, how do you feel about the leadership of our company? And they would tell him. And I don't know how long, days, weeks, I don't know how long that they did that. But what would happen ultimately after this was fulfilled and there was going to be a reveal and they were going to let all the workers know and usually a specific worker know that the guy you've been working with and the guy you train, he's the guy who owns the company. And almost always that story concluded with the guy who owned everything giving something to the people who work for him. He'd buy them a new car. He'd pay for their kids' college education. He'd get them a new house. Every story that I ever saw, the employee was always moved to find out that that was the boss. Usually they said, oh no, I can't believe what I said. But invariably, the owner was moved when he understood the plight of the people. And that's why God became flesh. You know why? Because now he understands. He's not a high priest that can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But he was in all point, points, tempted, tested like as we are. He never sinned, of course. But That passage in Hebrews then goes on to say to us, hey, you know what you can do? You can come boldly to the throne of grace. You know why? Because of the incarnation. You have a God who understands. How many times in the last 10 months have you thought no one understands? No one understands. No one understands what it's like. No one understands what it's like to be here in this house all the time with no interaction. He came into his own. and His own received him not. He says, I understand. It speaks of the incarnation, that little phrase made of a woman. It speaks of the virgin birth. (laughs) As you read this passage, made of a woman reminds us. Think about this. You say, well, it doesn't mention a man being involved in the conception. Why? Because there was none. There was not one. He was virgin born. And if he wasn't virgin born, we don't have a savior. Don't let anyone, don't let anyone talk you out of a virgin born son of God. That verse, the miracle of his birth, it speaks of the incarnation and the virgin birth. And then we find it speaks of the omnipotence of Christ. Say, how is that? How does made of a woman manifest power? Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. 
God is speaking here to Satan. Hey, we do. We have a formidable opponent. We understand that, right? We have a formidable opponent. He's the prince of the power of the air. He is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But let me tell you something. Listen to me this morning. If you don't get anything else, I say, don't miss this. That roaring lion is no match for that baby in a manger. Our Savior bruised Satan and ultimately will destroy him. We could talk about the miracle of his birth, but let's finish this morning. Let's talk about the purpose of his coming. Galatians 4, 5 says this, to redeem them that were under the law. That's why he came. That's why he came. He didn't come so we could put up a Christmas tree. He didn't come so we could decorate. And I love it. I like it. I love all the traditions. It's beautiful. He didn't come so we could exchange gifts. And I love that part. He didn't come so we can, so we can eat. And I really love that part. He didn't come so we could get family together and celebrate with them. And I love that part. But he came to redeem them that were under the law. The word redeem there, it means paying a price to recover from the power of another. It's kind of like a ransom. You ever watch any of those old detective shows, any of those cop shows, and, and the call comes, and they said, if you ever want to see your son again, Jesus came for our redemption. He paid the price so that we could be free. Not only so that we could be free, so that we could become his sons. He didn't come to build buildings. He didn't come to promote kingdoms. This would discourage some, but he did not come for social justice or reform. He came to save the world. Someone said, if our greatest need was money, God could have sent an economist. If our greatest need was pleasure, he could have sent an entertainer. If our greatest need was better technology, he could have sent an inventor. If our greatest need were information, he could have sent us an educator. If our need were better government, he could have sent a politician. If our need were better health, he could have sent a physician. If our greatest need was to save the planet, he could have sent an environmentalist. But God knew that our greatest need involved none of those. God knew that our greatest need involved our sin and our alienation from Him. It, it involved our profound rebellion and our eternal punishment in hell. So God sent a Savior. And His name is Jesus. I know this. I know that in my life, He showed up when the time was right. See, I grew up here, and I heard the gospel from a very early age, and I made professions of faith. And, and kids can get saved, and I praise God that kids can get saved. But for whatever reason, I, I had a dummy attack, and man, I just couldn't, I struggled with it. But you know what happened? He showed up exactly when the time was right, and I was ready to trust him. I had tried everything. I had tried my works. I had tried everything. And one day, one day, Jesus showed up in my life at the perfect time, at the appointed time. Oh, by the way, Scripture speaks of one other appointed time. It's appointed unto man once to die. Before you have to face that appointed time, be sure you have experienced that other appointed time. You know, we had 70 people this morning in our service, and we asked everyone to wear a mask. There's a lot of fear, isn't there? There's a lot of fear. And, and I, I said this in the first service. You know, you can wear a mask. You can wash your hands raw. You can wait six miles away from people. But if God wants you to die, 
you're going to die. <laughs> it's appointed. There's an appointed time. I can do everything that I know to do to try to postpone that time. But my Bible says it's an appointed time. But it's okay. Because of that other appointed time. Amen. Terry, I thought a lot about Jimmy this week. I thought a lot about him this week. And we were shocked when he went to heaven. I wasn't surprised he went to heaven. Don't get me wrong. I was shocked about the timing of him going to heaven. <laughs> but you know why that family is going through what they're going through and able to function? Because they know about that other appointed time. You got to know about that first appointed time. He came when the time was right. Father, thank you for giving your son. Jesus, thank you for being willing to go.